Welcome uh, everyone. Bonjour et bienvenue au Centre de recherche mathématique. My name is Alexandre Giroir. I am the Deputy Director for Scientific Activities at the CRM. And today we have the pleasure to welcome uh, everyone to a special colloquium celebrating the 2021 CAP CRM Prize. This prize was created in 1995 by the Centre de Recherche Mathematique and the Canadian Association of Physicists. It is a recognition for, of exceptional achievements in theoretical and mathematical physics. And uh, therefore, I'm very happy to introduce the winner of the 2021 CAP CRM Prize, Professor Robert Rosendorf from UBC. Uh, J'ai le grand plaisir de vous présenter le gagnant du prix CAP CRM 2021, le professeur Robert Rosendorf. Robert Rosendorf obtained his PhD from the Ludwig Maximilian University in uh, Munich in 2003. He was then a fellow, postdoctoral fellow at Caltech, 2003 to 2006, and then uh, for two subsequent years, a postdoc at the Perimeter Institute, and also following that, a Sloan Research Fellow in 2009. But already in 2008, he became a professor at UBC. Professor Rosendorf has been awarded the CAP CRM Prize for his eminent contributions to the theory of quantum computing. <laughs> and two of his main contributions are the invention of measurement based compu quantum computation, jointly with Hans Briegel of University of Innsbruck. Also, he has proposed an architecture for fault tolerant quantum computation that is local in spatial dimensions. Now, I would be lying if I said that I understand what what I just said really means, but I'm sure after uh, the next hour it will become a bit more clear. So please join me in congratulating Professor Rosendorf for the prize and welcome, welcoming him to give this prize lecture. The stage is now yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, Alexander, thank you very much for your kind introduction. I have to start with disappointing you. So measurement-based quantum computation for tolerance in two dimension will not be more clear after my talk today. I'm not uh, uh, planning to talk about it today, but I mean, if you have questions about it, I would be very happy to answer them, of course. So instead, let's, uh, let's turn to the subject of today's talk, which is more in the direction of the foundations of quantum mechanics and how that relates uh, to quantum computation. So the title of the talk is the hidden variable model for universal quantum computation. Yeah, and this is joint work um, with uh, a former postdoc of mine who is now a professor uh, at Bilkent University in uh, Turkey, Jihan Okai, and my PhD student, Michael Zorel. Okay, so just kind of to set the stage for what I'm talking about today. Uh, so this is about the theory of quantum computation, uh, foundations of quantum computation, you may say. And the question that you, that you can't get around asking in this field is, what makes quantum computation work? And a bunch of proposals have been made. Yeah, as soon as you ask these questions, Answers are volunteered, so there's a largeness of Hilbert space, so position interference, entanglement. These are kind of the more usual suspects, and it gets a little stranger. Contextuality, Wigner function negativity. Uh, I have worked uh, a long time uh, on the latter two, contextuality and Wigner function negativity. But uh, yeah, so like all the other candidates, they are not giving you the full picture, and so we are moving to something else now. So this something else is what I'm going to talk about. We don't, I can't put a name here because we don't know any name, uh, but it has to do a lot with algebraic structure and trying to suggest this structure to you as a, uh, a, 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 as a subject for discussion in math. Okay, we, we'll get to that as we progress here through this talk. Okay, so that's, that's the basic idea. What makes quantum computing work? The field is 30 years old or more, we don't know yet. And so we are asking the question again and again. All right, so what you see here is the first paragraph of our paper. So uh, let me read it to you. It is often pointed out that the fundamental objects in quantum mechanics are amplitudes, not probabilities. In fact, notwithstanding, here we construct the description of universal quantum computation and hence of all quantum mechanics in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces in terms of Bayesian update of a probability, this Bayesian update of a probability distribution. In this formulation, quantum algorithms look structurally akin to classical diffusion problems. So if I had read this paragraph as a graduate student, it would have given me the shivers. 
I, I can quite reliably say that because I remember certain things of when I was a graduate student. So now am I not only reading uh, out this paragraph aloud, I have also written it. Yeah, so uh, there's a bit of a trajectory here. Okay, and this is this construction is what I wanna talk to you about today. Okay, so here's a summary of, of the result. Um, you, some of you may be able to parse it. They will, all the, the words that show up here in, in this result statement, some of you may not, and don't worry, I, I will go through all these things or some of these things here, what, what they mean when I go through the background portion of my talk. Okay, so we have constructed the hidden variable model with positive representation for all quantum states, a subset of unitary gates, the so-called Clifford gates, and a subset of measurements, so-called Pauli measurements. So we're not restricting the states when we have a positive representation, but we are restricting the operations, the unitaries and quantum computation and the measurements. However, the restrictions are so mild that they do not affect the computational power of the model. This is still a universal computational model. So everything that can be computed uh, on a quantum computer can be computed within this model. Okay, so this is the result and kind of, uh, it is a little bit surprising because the positivity everywhere is not what one would expect. And I show you, uh, a result to, to that effect uh, shortly, you know, you would expect negativity somewhere. Okay, and I, I want to tell you about uh, what all of this means. Okay, so the need for negativity. And so the physics version of this is coming from Wigner function. So this is what it refers to, Wigner function, cherry, a cherished uh, concept in, in physics. Yeah, so that describes every, every quantum state can be described uh, by a Wigner function, but it is a special representation of a Wigner function. It's something that, uh, that lives on a phase space, spanned by position and momentum. So this is the quantum counterpart to what you would classically call a probability distribution over phase space, with the only difference that the Wigner function can go negative, which of course probability distributions cannot. And whenever that happens, the physicist says, oh, there's something quantum going on. And we can transpose this entire concept of Wigner function and negativity to quantum computation. And uh, then you can actually make these statements rigorous. So you can prove, and I will go through this uh, a little bit today, that if negativity is absent, then there cannot be a quantum speed up. Okay, and then we have to talk about what this means for the result uh, that I just mentioned. Okay, so here, need for negativity. So here's a theorem by Chris Ferry. So it says that a quasi-probability representation of quantum theory must have negativity either in its representation of states or measurements or both. So it seems to directly contradict what is the main result that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, but there is no contradiction. There's a different in assumptions. So kind of our assumptions are a little bit different. So uh, if you go into the fine print of the result that I'm quoting here, it talks about Wigner functions that come from operator bases. Our result doesn't do that. So in fact, it is not even unique. So every Quantum state can be represented by a number of quasi-probability or probability distributions. Um, and also this result requires, uh, talks about representations about all measurements. So we are restricting um, the set of measurements to Pauli measurements uh, and thereby also evading that no-go result here. But again, our assumptions do not take away from universal quantum computation. So, um, I'm mentioning this result here as, as one of many that seem to be at conflict with the result that, that I'm talking about today, but there is really no contradiction. It's always in the assumptions. Just, I wanna say this once and for all, and we could do this for other theorems. I don't know, Gleason's theorem, PBR theorem, Bell's theorem, and all these things. All right, so now, and again, what was my result that I am always referring to it is this result. This is the main result of the talk. So what is it good for? So I think it is 
interesting from the foundations of quantum mechanics perspective. Yeah? So it's a, a hidden variable model uh, that describes all of quantum mechanics. And don't we have all these theorems like Bell's theorem, quotient specker, PBR, and so on and so forth that tell us that such a thing cannot be constructed? Okay, so I think it's in, and again, it's in the assumptions. So I think it is uh, an interesting angle at those problems. And then for me as a quantum information scientist, um, well, we wanna, we wanna take it towards quantum computation and we wanna know where the speed up comes from, um, where the efficient classical simulation of quantum computation breaks down, or where simulation becomes inefficient. And our work is a, is a new approach to getting a grasp on these questions. Yeah, so that is what it is good for in my opinion. So now, if you were wondering whether there's any structure to my talk, but finally we're getting to the outline. And so uh, there is three parts to my talk. First, there's a background section in which I want to review a bunch of stuff. I want to review Wigner functions and the computational model to which we apply them, quantum computation with magic states. Second part of my talk will be the result. Yeah? So this is the hidden variable model that I've been stating earlier. And the third part is an invitation to you. So I figure uh, I speak to an audience of mathematician, mathematicians. And so the model that we come up with has a state space, um, it's a polytope, and that polytope is a purely mathematical object. And it, for us physicists, it's kind of hard uh, to figure out properties uh, of that uh, polytope. Uh, we have found out a few things, which I will tell you, but this third part is an invitation to you to find out more and faster. Okay, let's get started. Part one. So this is background information. So I want to illustrate to you before I tear it all down, why this concept of Wigner function negativity is important for quantum computation and particular speed up. Okay, so we saw this, this picture already. So this is now uh, the thing that we are talking about. This quasi-probability distribution over uh, phase space. So I, I, will, I will say a little bit more about it uh, shortly, but let me begin uh, on the computational side. Let me introduce the computational model that we're talking about. This is called quantum computation with magic states. So I hope that this is not the first talk about quantum computation that you hear and that you have some previous exposure to the circuit model. So quantum computation with magic states is a variant uh, of the circuit model, but with a twist. So you, you may, may have heard of this notion of a universal set of gates and uh, quantum computation with magic states doesn't use that. It doesn't use a universal set of gates. It uses a so-called Clifford gates. It's a restricted gate set. It's not sufficient for universal quantum computation by itself. And so we need another ingredient to which I uh, get in a, in a second. Uh, but first, what are Clifford gates? I, I, we, I don't want to go too much into the, the definition, but it is gates like the c naught gate, the Habermard gate, and, and things like this. And so, so if you have two Clifford gates and you compose them, then you also get a Clifford gate. So they, uh, they form a group. Okay, let, let me just give you the, the definition. So a Clifford gate, so just if, if, if it doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't matter too much, but let me give you the definition nonetheless. So a Clifford gate is a gate that conjugates all Pauli operators into Pauli operators. So that's what a Clifford gate is. It's a restricted gate set. It's not universal for quantum computation. So you need something else. And so this something else are the so-called magic states. So from some perspective, Magic states are very simple states. They are typically just one qubit states, but they are of a special form such that when you supply them to this set of Clifford operations here, then, uh, then you, re uh, then you uh, recover your universality of quantum computation. You can again compute everything uh, that a quantum computer can compute with no loss in efficiency. So you've been trading uh, certain gates in the universal set, you have removed them and replaced them by these magic states. So this looks like an unnecessary computation. Why would anybody think about a computational model like this? 
Oh, and by the way, uh, interrupt me whenever you have a question. I, I love to take uh, questions uh, during my talk. So if there's something not clear, please uh, raise your hand and interrupt. Ah, yeah. So why would anybody think about a computational model like this? Well, from a practical point of view, you might be thinking about, it came up earlier today, fault tolerance, quantum computation in, in the presence of decoherence. If you were interested in fault tolerance, you probably would set it up like this. So this scheme of quantum computation is known uh, to give us the highest fault tolerance thresholds and has the lowest overhead of fault tolerance. Okay, so this is how you would do it. That shall not concern us today. We are not concerned with practicalities. Uh, our reason for looking at this model is a different one. Namely, the reason is that computational power is shifted from the gates to the states. And so now, as I began my talk with, um, questions that we ask are, where is, the, where is the power of quantum computation? And we, if we ask this question in the context of this model, and it becomes a question about quantum states rather than processes. And that's a little bit of a simpler question. Okay, so now here, this is the question, which properties must these magic states have to enable a speed up? And there is an, an, an answer that has been given. And this answer is, well, the Wigner function of these magic states must be negative. Good, okay, so this is a result that has been obtained about 10 years ago in the group of Joseph Emerson at the University of Waterloo. So quantum computation with magic states can have a quantum speed up only if the Wigner function of the initial magic states is negative, okay? So here you have it together, quantum computation with magic states, Wigner functions. Negativity of Wigner functions is a precondition for speed up. Okay, so this is a result that I have to provide as reference for what I'm talking about. But again, what I'm really talking about is a counterpoint. Yeah? So you can have universal quantum computation. That means quantum computation with speed ups and get by without any negativity. Okay? And so we have to reconcile these two results. And again, it will be in the definition. So what we will find later is that uh, this result up here holds to certain definitions um, of quasi-probability functions. It doesn't hold for all quasi-probability functions. Good. Okay. So that's, uh, I just wanted to refocus to that. I, I would like to say a little bit more about Wigner functions since, you know, computational model and Wigner functions appeared here in our first theorem. So let me say a little bit more about Wigner functions. I will not go as far as writing down a complete definition because we will not need it. I will just give you a little bit of intuition. So let's start with classical physics, yeah? Classical physics can be formulated in, in phase space, you know, Liouville's theorem and that sort of stuff, okay? And if we had very precise initial conditions, a physical system would, re would be represented by a delta peak in phase space. And if we knew less about the system, that peak would broaden. Yeah, okay, so that's classical, uh, mechanics and phase space. Now you want to go to the quantum side. Quantum mechanically, you cannot have a delta function because of the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. So already from that, it is clear that something has to change. And yeah, no. So you cannot define a probability distribution, joint probability distribution between uh, position and momentum. And so you first have to define the quantum counterpart. And that quantum counterpart is the Wigner function. It is as close as you can get to a joint probability distribution. So it shares many properties with that probability distribution, but there's one difference, and that is that it's a quasi-probability distribution. It can go negative. This negativity is taken as an indicator of quantumness. And how this plays out in quantum computation, this is what I want to show you. Okay, but there's an intermediate step to make. So, well, this was... Uh, phase space like position and momentum that this lives in infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Quantum computation happens in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Mm -hmm. So for example, qubits or qubits or so on and so forth. And so we need to adopt <clears throat> the concept of the Wigner function. This adoption is straightforward when my finite Hilbert space dimension is odd. When my finite Hilbert space dimension is even, then things get tricky. And we will talk about that later. But if it is odd, nothing much happens. And I can basically straightforwardly adapt the Wigner function I already had from uh, Wigner's 1935 paper. 
Okay, so I will not write down the definition of the Wigner function because all that matters for us today is two properties of it. So the first of these properties is covariance under Clifford Gates. So let's see what this means. So this is, this is a, a property that the finite dimensional Wigner function has. So, uh, so, so, so what does it mean covariance? So it's all encapsulated in this formula. So what do we have here? We have a Wigner function. That's a function of a particular state as represented by its density matrix. And Wigner functions are functions of phase space. And so what you have here and here are points phase space. Okay, so just kind of to explain to you the basic notation. So now let's uh, pause this formula a little more closely. So what we have here is a Wigner function of a quantum state rho. Over here, we have the Wigner function of a transformed quantum state and has been transformed under one of these Clifford unit types. You remember Hadamard gates, C naughts, and that sort of stuff. Okay, so untransformed Wigner function, transformed Wigner function are related in the following fashion. So the transformed Wigner function uh, evaluated at a certain point in phase space is exactly the original Wigner function evaluated at a different point in phase space, where this new point in phase space is now related to the former uh, by an affine transformation. So this is uh, what covariance is. This was too many words. Let's, uh, let's uh, draw it in a picture. So this is a Wigner, this is a Wigner function. It's a delta distribution focused uh, uh, on a particular point in phase space. We apply a Clifford unitary to it. And all that happens is that this delta p moves to another location in phase space. It doesn't blur out or, or anything. It's just moved from one location to another. Yeah, so this is what, uh, uh, what Clifford covariance is about. So this doesn't hold for all the unitaries, only for our special Clifford unitaries, which are in the gate set of quantum computation with magic states. These are the unitary operators in that computational model. There's no other unitary gate. Okay, so the covariance was the first property that mattered. Second property uh, is the positivity preservation on the Pauli measurement. So again, we need odd dimension here, odd Hilbert space dimension. Okay, so if we have a non-negative Wigner function and apply describing some quantum state, and then apply a Pauli measurement to that quantum state. Well, then, if the initial Wigner function was non negative, the resulting Wigner function is non negative as well. It's also, also an important property. So, Pauli measurements do not introduce negativity to, to Wigner functions. So, here's the thing in a picture, and the picture actually contains a little bit more. So, uh, okay, again, let's start with a Wigner function that's just a delta peak over a particular point in phase space. All right, so now what happens when you do a Pauli measurement? So what happens is that the resulting Wigner function spreads out. It, it has now support not on a single point in phase space anymore, but instead on, on the line in phase space. And furthermore, it is a ridge, so it's completely flat along that line in phase space. That's a, also an important property. Okay, so this is a positivity preservation of Wigner functions under Pauli measurement. Okay, and now very quickly, how this is used to show that negativity of a Wigner function is a precondition for quantum speed. So the way you show it is as follows. So let's assume the, the other case. Let's assume the Wigner function is not negative. So what we will show is that then uh, there's an efficient classical simulation method hence no quantum speed up, yeah? Okay, just take the, the negative of this. So you need, uh, you need negativity for a speed up. Okay, so, so uh, now what is the classical simulation algorithm? So we prove the existence of it by providing one, and this is what the, sim the simulation algorithm looks like. So it begins um, by sampling from from the Wigner function, which by assumption is a probability distribution of the initial state. Okay, so you can do that. And then you go through the algorithm. So the algorithm consists of Clifford gates and Pauli measurements. You know, once you have the sample, so the Clifford gates, you're just shifted around. Whenever a measurement happens, well, this involves 
flick, flipping a bunch of coins and you know you land somewhere on this ridge uh, that is associated with Pauli measurement. Yeah, so this can all be efficiently classically simulated. Okay, so if yeah, if you if you have no negativity to begin with, then you can efficiently classically simulate. Huh? But I just wanted to point that out because this simulation algorithm will be a recurring theme in, uh, in my presentation today. Okay, so this almost concludes the background part, um, but I would very quickly talk about the even dimensional case. So, in, so, so uh, in even dimension, nothing of what I just said straightforwardly applies. There was a noise. Is there a question? There's no question, okay. So, what a pity. Oh, anyway, in even dimension, um, things are different. And I, I don't have the time to go into this, um, but well, there are these little monsters here. These are certain proofs of the quotient Specker theorem that David Merman came up with. They are called Merman square and Merman star. And their existence is kind of in the way uh, of the picture that we develop for the odd dimensional case uh, just uh, being applicable to the even dimensional case as well. So I cannot quite, I don't have the time to really explain to you the connection, but that's basically what, where the problem is. This problem can be overcome, um, but it, there's a price to pay. So we can come up with a similar result than what we had in odd dimension, but for a much more complicated construction of phase space. So let me restate, Emerson's or uh, uh, Veitch's uh, theorem again. So we have the exact same theorem here. Um, so quantum computation with magic states can have a speed of only if quasi probability function of the initial state is negative. And so this is now for a different quasi probability distribution with two prices. So the quasi probability distribution for which this can be established is no longer unique. So, you know, for every quantum state, you can represented in many different ways. And also phase space itself has become a much more complicated object than what it used to be. It used to be a quadratic grid, and this is no longer the case. Okay, so just wanted to point out, you can extend the results that you had for odd dimension to even dimension if you're willing to pay this price. Okay, so this is related to my subject of today, but it's not the top. But we have reached the end of the background section. So let's move on to the result. So what I will be talking about is a hidden variable model where all negativity disappears. So for all multi-qubit quantum states, we can represent them positively and the operations of our computational scheme, namely Clifford gates and Pauli measurements can also be uh, represented positively. Okay. Good, so this is what I'm gonna show you. So first, there's a section on the model and the results. Then we will talk about what this means for Wigner function negativity. And we wanna talk about what it means for classical simulation of universal quantum computation. All right, let's get started. So uh, yeah, so um, this is the definition of the state space. Um, and that's actually, it's, it's a busy slide and it's also in a way, the result. So the work here goes into the definitions. So I will show you a few proofs later, one or two, and they're all terribly simple, but that's okay because the work is in the definitions. And then not every proof that we have to do is, is, is simple, but the first ones are. Okay, so the question that led us here was the following. So for any number of qubits, what is the largest state space that is closed on the Pauli measurement? So I take a state, uh, in that space, I just sandwich it from the left and right with a Pauli projector uh, and renormalize. And uh, then I want to remain in my space. So what is the largest space that has that property? So we figured out over time that this is the question to ask. So this was not self-evident. It took us some time to realize. And we figured it out. And once we we asked the question, we could actually uh, solve it after a while. And it leads us to this definition. So this is our notion of, of state. So there's a little bit of background that you need to know. So we have the, a set of states denoted by curly SN. N is for the number of qubits 
and the symbol S is here for the stabilizer states. So some of you may know stabilizer states, some of you may not know. So let me just very quick, quickly say what a stabilizer state is. A stabilizer state is a joint eigenstate of a bunch of Pauli operators. Yeah, a bunch of commuting Pauli operators. So um, when you have sufficiently many commuting Pauli operators, you will find um, that they define the state uniquely. Yeah? So the, the state is in an eigenstate of them with a certain eigenvalue. And if you have sufficiently many of these commuting Pauli operators, they define the state uniquely. So the set of those Pauli operators is called a stabilizer. And the state that is stabilized by them is called a stabilizer state. Just kind of wanted to say that in preparation for this definition. Because the stabilizer, so there's three conditions for elements of our state space, and the third of these uh, refers to stabilizer states. Okay, but let's begin at the beginning. First condition, our states and elements of our state space have to be Hermitian. Yeah, so we remember that density matrices have that property. Well, they also have to have trace one. We remember density matrices have this property. The third property now involves the stabilizer states. So if I take a state and, um, uh, well, and Sandra perform the, the trace in a product of that state with a projector onto, a, on, onto any stabilizer state, the result has to be non-negative. That's our third condition, okay? And so I think this condition is also somewhat familiar from ordinary quantum states. And for ordinary quantum states, you would require this for any pure state, not only for uh, stabilized states. Okay, and there's an immediate consequence. So these two conditions, first and second, they are the exact same as for ordinary density matrices. Third condition is, is less stringent than what you would uh, uh, require for quantum states. And so this means that in, in this set of states that are here defined, the, the proper density matrices are a subset. Uh, so our, our state polytope um, represents all the quantum states and more, all the proper quantum states and more. Okay, just wanted to point that out. Uh, good, okay, so, uh, yeah, so this uh, is a definite. So this uh, definition gives rise to a polytope, and we we denote this by lambda n. N is for the number of qubits to which we refer. So there's one such polytope for any number of qubits, and any such polytope is uh, defined by a bunch of extremal vertices. And so we uh, denote the vertices here by this symbol. A is the vertex operator in this set, extremal. Uh, and alpha is a label, and all these labels together, they form our phase space. So this is our notion of generalized phase space. And uh, this phase space is finite, we can show, for all, all numbers of qubits n. Okay, so this is the definition, and now, and the, yeah, the work, this work actually went into it, and now we want to prove certain things uh, about this state space. Excuse so me, Robert, a yes. question? Am yeah. I supposed to understand why you call that a hidden variable model? I think you uh, you will uh, the next slide will hopefully provide clarification uh, okay. about this question. Yeah. So so let's see. Um, let's let's go through this slide. This is our first theorem, and uh, maybe let's get back to your question when I'm this done discussing this slide. Fine. Thank you. Yeah. So okay. So this is a theorem here, and so so it says. Um, we can, everything is positive. So states are positive and operations uh, on that state space are, are positive. Um, okay, so let's begin with the states. So every quantum state can be described by a, a probability distribution over, uh, I mean, a linear combination of these extremal vertices. So basically, a quantum state corresponds to a probability distribution over our phase space. So I think that that is something that our model has in common with a, a hidden variable model. Yeah. And so then, uh, positivity preservation, this is something that you might not consider uh, in a hidden variable model. 
I mean, as far as I'm, a, I'm familiar with hidden variable models, they, they do not consider up, up, uh, state update. But, and I'm not saying there's no such thing. Yeah, but um, at any rate, we do consider state update. We consider sequences of measurements. Yeah, they can potentially be non-commuting. It doesn't matter, arbitrarily long sequences uh, of measurements. And our model does have to, um, does have to, uh, allow that it has to has to describe it and has to agree in its predictions for these sequences of measurements with what quantum mechanics says. Okay, and so so the statement here is if I uh, apply a Pauli operator to any of these vertices, I'm getting something inside the polytope. So I'm getting a prob probabilistic mixture of vertices. Yeah. Okay, so this is item number two. And item number three is the Born rule. I think that should again, hopefully remind you of what you have in a hidden variable model. So now we are considering uh, doing a measurement and obtaining a certain out. So, so what we're measuring is the, the Pauli observable TA. And uh, so we, we, what we are interested in the probability uh, P, capital P for getting the outcome s. So, you know, there's an eigenvalue plus one, minus one, two possible uh, outcomes here. Now, what's the probability for getting either of those? And within our model, this probability is uh, computed as follows. So quant the, the quantum expression would be this, uh, and in our model, the expression is this. So this is just kind of sum over a product of a probability and a conditional probability. So the, the probability comes from the description of the state. And the conditional probability uh, comes from the observable. So this is uh, now uh, the probability for the outcome S uh, uh, given the measurement was of the observable TA conditioned on, uh, on uh, the position, I mean, on uh, how do you say, the, the hidden variable model and that the position in phase space and that is summed over, okay? So uh, yeah, so I think that is that is how probabilities should be described in a hidden variable model. Okay. So yeah, so uh, that was that is I, I that, that is my answer to your question. So this point and this point look exactly like you would have it in a hidden variable model, and this is something extra. I'm I'm not sure. I mean, the hidden variable models that I'm familiar with. Do not talk about sequences of states and state update and so on and so forth. But to describe physics, we need this as well. So, is this uh, an answer? Yes, thank uh, you. Really? Yes, yes. Yes. Thank yeah? you very much. Yes. Good. Thank you. Okay. So everything is positive in this model. Good. So now we could go about proving this theorem. Uh, first statement: positive representation of quantum states. So this one we have already proven. So this is what this is that picture. Yeah. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's uh, do the better part of the proof of the second item, namely that positivity is preserved when we apply a Pauli measurement. Yeah? Okay, so the statement was this, we have this sandwich of our vertex, uh, extremal point of the polytope, and to the left and right, we have up a, a projectors corresponding to Pauli measurements. And that has to be this whole object has to be a probabilistic mixture of vertices, so it has to lie inside the polytope modular normalization. Okay, so that's what we want to. That's what we uh, want to prove. Okay, and the proof is very simple, or well, the better part of it is very simple, and I just want to go through it just because maybe it's structurally interesting. So recall the third property of the definition. So we required. Um, that for every point inside the polytope, so in particular also for the vertices, uh, it holds that the trace of this inner, uh, sorry, the, the inner product between uh, the vertex and project onto a stabilizer state uh, is large or equal to zero yeah, for every stabilizer state. So let's just go back. This was our third condition here in the definition of the state space. Okay. <clears throat> so remember that condition. So now we want to know if the same holds for uh, for the sandwich after the projection. Yeah. So for the state after the projection. So that would be given by this trace over here to the left. Okay. It's a very simple calculation. 
Well, trace uh, is cyclic, so I can take the projector over to the other side. And uh, the first step, not a hard calculation, nothing's obviously hard here. And so I can put my brackets, you know, everything is associative, so I can put brackets as I please. And now I observe that we have a Pauli operator acting on a stabilizer step. And we know that modular normalization, this gives us just another stabilizer step. Okay, and so we are left with something that is non-negative by assumption. Uh, you're multiplying it with a constant that is also non-negative. So this gives us something uh, non-negative. And so we see that these conditions uh, are inherited uh, from before the projection to after the projection. Good, so this is the better part of the argument. This doesn't mean that the sandwich here is in the polytope because it doesn't have unit trace. Remember there was a second property, but we can now show that after normalization, uh, it is in the polytope. Okay, good. Uh, so this is just kind of what I wanted to show you in terms of proof. So again, they are not so difficult. It is uh, mostly in the definitions here. Good, okay, so there was a, uh, the proof. Let me now move on to the application. So uh, I wanna talk about quantum computation with magic states. And so, um, so what's the relation? Okay, so we have described the hidden variable model where all the states are positively represented. Uh, the Pauli measurements are positively represented. We just saw that in the theorem. The Clifford gates we have not yet talked about. Um, okay, so let me just fit in this last bit and I give the statement uh, without proof. Here it's kind of similar type of argument again. And so the statement is that I'm taking a vertex in my polytope and uh, then, uh, and then, okay, I'm conjugating this vertex under Clifford unitary, and that object then is a new vertex or is a vertex of the polytope as well. Okay, so this is Clifford covariance for this polytope. So we have that property, and this means in particular that um, uh, the Cl Clifford, unit, unit, Clifford unit unitaries also preserve uh, positivity. So all the operations we need preserve positivity. No, no negativity They're creeping up. And so then with this, um, the earlier theorem has a corollary, which we state here as uh, theorem two. Universal quantum computation by Clifford unitaries and Pauli measurements on magic states can be described by iterated sampling from probability functions. Okay, so it's like in the Emerson case, except that there's no uh, no condition on the absence of negativity because by construction, there is no negative. And so, uh, yeah, so this time is without any additional conditions. This is about universal quantum computation, about all of quantum computation. So both the states and the operations are positively represented. So this can be done, and this is the hidden variable model in the title uh, of my talk, okay? And so now, what we need to do is we need to see a little bit how this fits with earlier results. Okay, so first, first I mean, how does it fit with the, with the result from the Emerson group, which established Wigner negativity as a precondition? I mean, evidently in this whole model, there is no uh, negativity. So the, this prior result is not invalidated, but we clarify it applies to a specific definition of the Wigner function. Yeah, so maybe for other dimension, it's a natural definition of the Wigner function. If you use that particular definition, then yes, uh, you, you can establish negativity as a precondition for speed up, but it hinges on this particular definition. Yeah? So, so the negativity as an indicator of quantumness is an artifact of a special choice. Yeah? We can make a different choice with our model and negativity is no longer the issue. Yeah, so no, no negativity ever occurs, and so it cannot be a precondition for speed up. So it's a matter of a special choice that was made up here. Okay, so this is what I have to say about Wigner function negativity. So next question, where does uh, simulation end? So let me begin with a disclaimer. So we do not claim that with this model, um, we can efficiently simulate universal quantum computation. So technically the question is open, you know, we cannot, we cannot show either, but everybody, including us, believes that efficiency, efficiency must break somewhere, yeah, must break down somewhere. 
Okay, but the question is where? If, if we settle on this common belief, then where? So, uh, and we don't know that. So this is a question we can ask. So can we understand the breakdown of efficiency of classical simulation in this model? And that's an open research, re, uh, research question. Yeah, okay, so, but then uh, maybe we have to clarify where do we deviate from, from the uh, Waterloo paper, fight it all. So they, for them, I mean, all they needed was uh, negativity for, for a speed up. And as soon as the Wigner function was positive, they, they had some cl efficient classical simulation. Why do we not get the same result? And, and the difference is that in our case, phase space is a much more complicated object and the conditional probability distributions that are involved in the Pauli update are, are much more complicated in their structures, not just kind of this ridge uh, on a line uh, over phase space. Yeah, so, it's a, yeah so, so this is what breaks down the simplicity of the probability distributions that you get after Pauli measurement. In our case, it's no longer simple as far as we know. And for that reason, the old argument of fight it all doesn't apply anymore. Good. So this concludes the second part of my talk. And I have a third part. And uh, this is an outlook. It is also the invitation to you guys, to you mathematicians. So we have introduced a new uh, state space, the lambda polytopes. And frankly, we know very little about them. And maybe you are enticed and maybe you can help us find out properties of these polytopes. So let me give you two things that we do know. First, before I go into this, is we have to talk about what knowing means in this case. So understanding the polytopes basically un means understanding the vertices. And so the question, here's a few questions. That's what we want to answer. But when, we can, when we answer these questions, then we say we know the polytopes. So can the vertices be fully classified? What are the update rules uh, for these vertices on the Pauli measurement? And where and how is quantumness hiding? in these vertices. So these are the questions that we want answered. So now let me tell you what we do know, and there's certainly a huge gap. Okay, two facts. First fact, well, we know um, among these vertices, we know one class. Yeah? It's an infinite class of vertices, it's infinite because while for every number of qubits, um, the polytope is a finite structure, but if we look at all numbers of qubits, that makes it infinite. Yeah? It can be an infinite number of qubits. Okay, so it's an infinite class overall. And yeah, but just the tiniest fraction of vertices. And yeah, so there's one class that, that we fully understand. And give me, let me give you a graphical representation of this understanding. So this is what these, uh, oh, what these, vertices look like as operators on Hilbert space. They, they, have, they are tensor product of a stabilizer tail and the Majorana head. A stabilizer tail is just a projector onto stabilizer states, on, on a, onto any stabilizer state. And kind of this part here, the head, is composed of what comes uh, out of the jordan Bigner transformation when you apply it to Majorana fermions. Yeah, so this, this, this connection here to, Major, you know, jordan Wigner transformation, Majorana fermions, it comes up in the, in the physics of the Ising model. Maybe you have met it in that context. It comes up here as well. And we have no idea why, really no idea why, but it does come up. Okay, so that's, okay, because of the Pauli operators that result from the jordan Wigner transformation, there's this Majorana connection here. Okay, so this is a graphical representation uh, for these vertices and they, they are fully classified. Yeah, so that's the first fact that we know. The second fact um, is the following. So, so you saw this tensor product uh, structure before. We had, had the stabilizer tail before, but now we replace the, the Majorana head by a general vertex. So we know if we take an n qubit vertex of our polytope and it attach uh, the projector onto a stabilizer state by a tensor product, when then this gives an operator uh, on the Hilbert space for n plus m qubits, yeah? m qubit stabilizer projector here, n qubit vertex 
So the combined object is again a vertex of this larger polytope. So this holds for every uh, every vertex that we begin with on, on, on the smaller set of qubits. Okay, so that is a fact that we know, the general fact that we know. And also when it when we talk about simulating quantum computation with these types of composite vertices, the hardness is only in that part. So we can always efficiently reduce simulation of quantum computation on this whole object to just kind of that part. Okay, so this is pretty much a summary of what we know about these polytopes. So most about them, we do not know. Yeah, so this is my invitation to you. Let me conclude. So uh, what we have done here is we have described the hidden variable model for universal quantum computation and everything in it is positively represented, the states and the, op the operations that occur. So there's no negativity anywhere. I repeat the disclaimer, the classical simulation of this algorithm is not necessarily efficient. And indeed, highly unlikely that it is. That would kill the field of quantum computation. It's very highly unlikely, but we rigorously, we do not know by the way, but we certainly do not claim efficient classical simulability of quantum computation. Okay, and kind of as a, as a bit of an outlook, the lambda polytopes that I introduced to you, they represent a new approach to identifying the cause of the quantum speed up. You know, I mean, all the, let's go back to, to this uh, first slide of my talk that I showed you with all these answers to the question of where the speed up comes from. Entanglement, superposition interference, Wigner function negativity, contextuality, none of this applies. So we have a model that looks superficially very classically and yeah, we wanna identify quantumness in it. Yeah? And so we have not done this yet, but uh, I'm sure if we can solve this problem, it will give us new insight uh, about uh, where the quantum speed up comes from. So thank you very much. Um, that is all I wanted uh, to talk about today. Here's the journal reference if you're interested. And uh, yeah, so I'm open for questions. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, indeed, we have time for questions. So please go ahead and just unmute yourself. Okay, if I may, me again. Um, just to be sure, your hidden variable model is not a local hidden variable model, is it? It's not a local one, no, it is not. Okay. Yeah, so... Uh... And, and actually, where... where I, 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 obviously, I did not follow the detail so what's not local about it it's just but not local. local about it yes yes i mean it it, it nowhere singles out local stuff mm -hmm. so if, yeah. you, if, you, if you had bad inequalities or yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. You, you would single out local observables uh for us the notion of observable is here linked to pauli yeah so it's only pauli observable yes, 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 but yes. it can be non-local or local right yes 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 so I guess the answer to my question was not local about it is that nothing about it is local. <laughs> nothing about it is local. Right, Locality that's right. Okay. no role in this model. Yeah, yeah, there was not a point at all. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? So I have an extremely naive question. Um, is this in any ways related to the actual uh, idea that, that uh, quant like of building quantum computers? Most remotely. I mean, uh, by and large, it is not related to the idea of building quantum computers. So. So maybe let me answer the question from this end. We know, you know, there is a, in this field of quantum computation, pretty much everything boils down to two questions. Can I build a quantum computer? Can I use it for something? And uh, so except for this fault tolerance discussion that I had earlier, which is really tangential, this has absolutely nothing to do with the question of building a quantum computer. It has more to do with the question of what to do with the quantum computer. And it also doesn't answer this question directly. Um, but the, 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 the idea is this. And so I think I'm kind of happy you asked this question. So, the, I, so one question that everybody in the field must ask themselves, or, or, I mean, I, I think should ask themselves is, so if we, if we just go with what we have today, if we, if we just kind of take our understanding of quantum computation as we have it today and just kind of apply it to R&D, just kind of do the engineering and 
minimize the resources and da 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 da. Will, will this suffice to make quantum computing a success? Now, this is a question I think that, uh, that you can ask. And then depending on how you answer it, you choose your subjects of research. So if you think, yeah, enough is known, then you will focus on these resource uh, minimization things and decoherence and so on and so forth. But if you think that it's not the case, then you, uh, then you find, want to find out new stuff at the foundation. And it, in fact, the latter is my opinion. I think we do not know enough. And so we kind of, we, we bounce around in all sorts of weird places to pick up stuff uh, that could give us a clue for how to design quantum algorithms and even how to get ideas for programming techniques and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, and, and this is what this investigation pertains to. So it came out from, the, from this whole analysis of, of Wigner functions and we made a counterpoint to that, but it is really in the wider sense here to the search for, for the very basis of constructing quantum algorithms. This is what it is about, it has very little to do with the enterprise of actually building a quantum. Thank you very much. Anyone else wants to comment or ask something? Not, then let's thank Professor Rosendorf again for the talk and uh, congratulations again for the CAPCRM prize. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. It was my pleasure.